Praise the Lord. Good morning. It's a blessing to be in the presence of God. Uh, I enjoyed the worship. Thank you, choir, for leading us well. And for each one of you, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have allowed us to be in your presence, to hear your word. And we ask that as we, we share about Christ being the guarantee to you, our God, that you will make the message clear. Use me as your vessel and help each one of us to understand. Uh, we pray that you will enable us to have questions and you will respond to them because, Lord, you want us to believe in you by understanding who you are and how we can access you. So thank you, Lord. May your spirit guide and may you only allow me to speak what is, what is from you. Through Christ our Lord we have prayed. Amen. Uh, recently I, I saw... Uh, a message, actually, it appeared many times from different uh, WhatsApp uh, followers, and it was showing people in India, when it flooded, uh, they were escaping from their homes for safety, and they were carrying their goods. Uh, different uh, statues moving with them, helping their goods not to be, <laughs> not to be swallowed by the flood. And uh, I thought I should begin with that to show uh, how we as human beings are so desperate to find a way of having our own God. Even when we know that there is God who created everything. We must somehow find a way to add on something that we are responsible for. So that we feel that we, uh, we are responsible for our, our well-being. And on one hand, we are right because he wants us to participate in how we shall be well, not only in the lives on earth, but even life after. But we need to understand that there are things God has done that we can't add anything on them. And when we are looking at Christ being the guarantee, one that guarantees our access to God, I want us from the start to understand that there is nothing we can add on Christ to make us be better or to make us have access to God. So why are we talking about this? It's because apart from having a relationship with God, we are dead in our sins, we are lost. It is for our salvation for us to talk about Christ being the guarantee for our salvation. One who is guaranteeing our access to God. And the temptation for us to feel like we have to do something about ourselves, about our lives in order to be better is not just for us now. It started right with Adam and Eve. God creates them. He even gives them his presence. He's there with them. He visits them evening and morning, has a discussion with them, but somehow they think they have to do something. What God is doing is not enough. It is not enough. And so they they, they listen to the voice of the enemy that they want to be more than what God has given them. And so they sin, they eat the fruit and because they want to be like God. They are not satisfied. So dissatisfaction as far as our divine nature is concerned is a big temptation even when God has done great for us. And even with the Israelites, he is with them. He saves them from Egypt. He walks there with them through the, the wilderness. He gives them the law. He has done miracles for them. They actually know, consciously they know, God is with them. But when they reach in Israel, why do they continue to confess that we are the Lord's? We are children of Abraham. We are a chosen nation. They know that. They even have a temple. They go to worship in the temple. They say with their mouth that they are the Lord's. But they worship Baal because they have a temptation of thinking. I mean, it is just there within them. What God is, is providing is not enough. We must find something tangible for us so that we can feel physically we are doing something about our salvation, about our lives. We must do something. They worship very many gods in addition to the temple, including the kings, even the priests. And God says, these people are lost. I have done everything for them. They claim to know me, as Jeremiah says. 
that you come before me and you raise up your hands and you say we are the Lord's, we are redeemed. But are you redeemed to do all these abominable things, putting me aside and, and doing your own things? They are even fasting, by the way. These people, the Israelites, they are fasting even when they are still doing evil, praying. And in Isaiah 58, God tells them, you keep complaining that why do you fast and I do not answer. And he says it's because when you fast, it is not for my will. It is for your own will. You fast so that you can fight. You can oppress people. You even fight through your prayers. Wicked fists during your fasting. And he's saying you cannot fast like that and I answer. You have to change your ways. You have to change your thinking. I must be the only one who is your God and your focus should be about me. I must be the only one. I must be sufficient if you want to have a good relationship with me. And so, he sees that they are lost and then he says, okay, let me help them. It seems I have to do something else. And he says, let me go and dwell among them so that they can know they don't have to do anything for themselves except through me. And he comes in the image of Jesus Christ. God among us. So that when we have him, our eyes will not look and say, let me do this, let me do this, let me do this. Because now you have God within you. And he comes, he dwells among us. And he speaks to us about the word of God. He even says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's actually living among the Jews. The very people who are God's people. Actually, the way he's living among us. But surprisingly, the people to whom he comes to guarantee to them that when they have him, they have enough. And they just have to access the Father through him. They think, uh-uh. This person is not the right one. There has to be something more. That has always been the temptation. There has to be something more. Not this that we have. Not this that we have. And we are suffering that even today in the church as believers. There has to be something more that we can add to Christ. He can't be enough. But the writer of the letter to the Hebrews is saying Christ is the guarantee for what we need for salvation. He's the one that gives us access to the Father. And as we were singing, all that we suffer is because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Even our confusion. We want to sort it ourselves. And so the lesson that we read was talking about Christ as the high priest who guarantees our access to God. He's talking about that, that image of priesthood. That is from there in the Old Testament. A little background of the priesthood in the Old Testament. We see that during the Exodus, when they were crossing through the desert of Sinai, God built up a people of Israel as a kingdom of priests. They are known, the Jews, as a kingdom of priests. And they are a consecrated nation. As today, Peter tells us, we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. I am connecting what was there for the Jews then to be what is here for us now. We are a royal priesthood. Praise the Lord. And so these priests in the Old Testament, God has chosen everyone in Israel to be part of that royal priesthood. But within them, he forms another priesthood. He chose one of the 12 tribes, that of Levi, the tribe of Levi for liturgical service, to enable people to access God in prayer. Those priests were consecrated by means of a unique rite. I mean, they have to be anointed. And their functions and duties and rites were established in a very detailed way than any other leader in, in Israel. They are of the tribe of Levi. The members of this tribe, they are priestly by excellence. Just being born in that tribe, you know you are born into the priesthood. They did not receive any inheritance when the, the shares were being given to the other tribes of Israel. The priests were not given any inheritance because God was to be their inheritance. What is brought to the altar is theirs. They didn't get a share of the land or wealth or minerals, no. What is given in terms of tithe and offerings is to take care of them. 
<clears throat> so, having been appointed to proclaim the word of God, these priests of the tribe of Levi, they were to help people to commune with God by means of offering sacrifices for their sins. Whoever sinned had to come to the priest and they had times for offering sacrifices for different reasons. They would give prayer on behalf of the people. The priest was always a source of hope. If I am desperate, I know I have sinned, then I have to go to the priest because without him, I have no guarantee to God. I can't access God. There has to be a priest, one of the tribe of Levi. They are a source of hope and glory. They are a source of strength. After he has prayed for me, I know I go back renewed, forgiven. They were a source of liberation from sin and oppression. Of, and within Israel, so long as they maintained the faith between the people and God, then they were safe. But as we have seen, the people still failed. Even when they had priests, they went to worship other gods. So this priesthood is actually not sufficient. It is failing. It is not enabling them to access God. I mean, the priests themselves sinned. And when you read Isaiah and Jeremiah, God is saying he will punish the priests for misleading the people. Including the prophets whom God had sent. Some of them were prophesying lies. And so, there is no guarantee among the people of God that they can access God. Because even the people that are supposed to show them God's way, the priests, they are also sinful. They have misled the people. And these were doing every ritual according to the law of Moses that he had given them. Praise the Lord. And so we see God coming and is saying, yes, this system of the law of offering sacrifices by the priesthood is not sufficient. It has to pass away. The law has to pass away. And that is the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. The old covenant is based on the law. We have to be saved through the law, through the priests offering sacrifices for our salvation. But the challenge is they offered sacrifices year after year and people remained without being cleansed. And that's what the writer of the letter of the Hebrews is saying that if the system of offering sacrifices by the priests was sufficient, there would have been no need for a new priesthood. Because people would have become saved. They would have become holy before God. And so Hebrews 10 from verse 1, it actually tells us that the old system of the law was a shadow of what was to come. But when Christ comes, we will no longer need to refer to that. And so some people ask, why do we read the Old Testament? If we have the new covenant, why don't we follow everything as it is written? It is written because it helps us to know how God is sovereign. How he wants us to be well with him. We we'll go to eat to see how we failed to save ourselves no matter how we tried. We go to eat to know that God is the one that holds everything together from the beginning to the end. And he desires to have a good relationship with us. It is the Old Testament that actually tells us that the New Testament will come. Established by Christ, where I will not need anything else, any priest, to help us access God, but Christ will be enough. Praise the Lord. And so, when Christ is here, as we read in Hebrews 10, from verse 1, the old system under the law was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the things themselves. Sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. That is verse 1 of Hebrews 10. Verse 3 says, but instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take our sins. And I want to say that if we were still under that system now, we would have no goats and, and bulls and sheep to help us be cleansed from our sins. Because year after year, we have to sacrifice goats. But now, look at how many we are. And if each one of you is to sacrifice goats whenever you sin, even the priests are to sacrifice goats, I don't have even a chicken at home. So I don't know what I would sacrifice. 
How many of you have goats and cows? Do you see how God made it easy for us that he said Christ is a sufficient sacrifice for us? <clears throat> and so the spirit testifies to us that God did what is right. And so when we read in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 16, the Lord says, this is a new covenant I will make with my people. These are words of prophet Jeremiah. On that day, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them in their minds. I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. And, and Paul says, uh, sorry, the writer of the letter of the Hebrews says that when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. And that's why we don't offer sacrifices now because Christ was offered as a sacrifice that is sufficient for us. Praise the Lord. Now, I'm giving that background of the old system of, of the priesthood so that we can understand when God comes in, what he's trying to help us do. And from Hebrews, we see that God has helped us. God has helped us to make sure that we understand what he has done for us. He's speaking to us. And when we read in verse 14, he says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. He offered himself on the cross. He died. Blood was shed. And he said, it is done. Those who had no access to the Father, the setting, the way it was in the Old Testament, only the priest could go at the altar to offer sacrifices on behalf of the people. And if you are not a priest, then you don't have access to God. You are an inter there is an intermediary, a priest, to help you access God. And when Christ dies at the cross, the very minute that he, his soul is separated from his body, the curtain is torn into two. To show that there is no longer anything separating us from the Father. The altar is open for us. Wherever you are, you don't need <coughs> to to look for a priest to help you access the Father. You don't need me. You don't need Reverend Gerard Ayabale. You don't need Reverend uh, uh, Misusela. You have access to the Father. And that's why when Jesus is speaking to the woman at the well, in John chapter 4, they have a discussion at, on a hill where uh, Jacob dug the well. And it is located in the northern part of, of Israel. Where the land of the Samaritans, that's where they go and they, they get the water. And Jesus comes and they have a discussion. And uh, they, talk, they start to talk about the Messiah. And, and the woman says, I know that when the Messiah comes, he will explain to us all these things. For you, the Jews, you say that we must go to Jerusalem to worship. If we want to access God, we have to go to Jerusalem. But our ancestors actually worshipped on this hill. And Jesus says, woman, believe me, time has come that the true worshippers will not need to go to Jerusalem or to be at, at any place or to be in this place for they will worship God in truth and spirit. The Father desires those who are like that to worship him. Time is coming and it is now when the true worshippers will only need to worship God in truth and spirit because he knew he was going to remove the old system of first going through the priests or going to Jerusalem in the temple where there was the Ark of the Covenant. And, and they believed that that's where God was. He's removing the formula, the old formula that they have. And he's saying, I am the formula. You want access to the Father? I have come. You don't need anything else. You don't need anything else. You don't need to even face Jerusalem when you pray. In the Old Testament, they say when Daniel was playing, he was praying, he would face Jerusalem. That was how it was. Actually, even the Samaritans, when they built the synagogues, because they could not access the temple, they would be facing Jerusalem. That was the system. But God says in Jeremiah that I will dwell in their hearts. And time comes, he gives us the Holy Spirit. After Christ has ascended, he sends the Holy Spirit to dwell in us. So you don't need to go to Jerusalem for your prayers to be heard. Nor do you need to face Jerusalem. And unfortunately, like in the old days, there are people today who think Jesus is not enough. They teach and they even write papers. You even watch some preachers on television saying that for you 
to have your prayers answered, write them, put a small gift in the, in the note and send it to us. We are going to Jerusalem at, at, such, at such and at such a time. We will take your prayers. And there are those who say, yes, when I go to Jerusalem, my prayers are answered. How about what the Bible tells us? God is in every place. Why, how about when Jesus says time is coming that you will not need to go to Jerusalem? The temptation of thinking I must do more. What I have is not enough. Like Adam and Eve. The fact that God comes, that we have presence with him is not enough. We must do more. Yet he's there with them. Friends, you have Christ with you. He is sufficient. You don't need anything else to help you access the Father. And wherever you are, you can pray to him at any time, at any moment. He is with you. He guarantees your access to the Father. Praise the Lord. And, and I hope that the Holy Spirit helps us to understand that sometimes we strive too much to make things work for us, yet God has already done it. I have to pray at such and such an hour. That's when God hears those teachings that are going on written in books of some of the people that we think they are prominent. Too much devotion. When it is not actually well guided, it can just make you labor in vain. We need to be devoted. We need to be passionate about God. But we need to be passionate in the right way. And some say, you know, when you pray through Jesus, it is not enough. They want to combine things. And they say, you must pray during this season when this star is moving at this direction. The stars, Arias, and different stars, you must follow. And there is a book written by one of the people that leads prayers in Africa. And it's saying, you have to pray according to the movement of stars and the moon. And some people, when they are praying, they want to make sure that after they have prayed in the name of Jesus Christ, they call the sun and the moon to witness the prayers. You are saying, what's wrong with you? You have already prayed in the name of Jesus Christ and you think the, the sun and the moon must witness? These are created beings. They were created by God. You don't have to call them to witness. The blood of Jesus that was shed is enough. And Christ is sufficient. Can that be enough for you? Why do you want to, to make it too difficult and make, of people, make it hard for people who, who don't even know when the star moves to think that they are not Christian enough? And they, they, they misquote the scripture that my people perish for lack of knowledge. So you need to have this other knowledge in addition to the scriptures that you read. God was talking about the fact that they lacked knowledge of his word. They perished because the priests had not taught them his, his word. And so they were perishing. And now, when people have the word, people are adding in, there is another knowledge you need. How the stars move. The seasons of the sun and the moon. You have Christ is sufficient. Why do you continue to labor? Why do you continue to labor? That's why when you read the literature, make sure that you... You, you don't just take it wholesomely, even when it is written by a bishop, archbishop, or even me. Be careful what you read. Make sure that you check it with the scriptures. And anything that adds to Jesus, if anything says you need to add this to Christ, you know that that one is, is false. Because he guarantees our access to God. Praise the Lord. He is the, they had tried all those things, this is for, even following the stars, by the way. In the Old Testament, Isaiah tells them, those of you who interpret the stars, let them save you when I come to punish you. Let them save you because you have trusted in your interpretation of the, of the stars. And of course, they were not going to save them because they cannot save. They also need, <clears throat> need God to sustain them wherever they are. In Philippians 3, verse 1 to 10, Paul talks about the value of knowing Christ. And it's because Paul was one of those that followed the law, the practices of the Jews. He's one of those that ensured that he did what the law required. And then he meets Christ when he is actually on the mission to make sure that those who are following the law should die. 
And then Christ saves him and he realizes that all the efforts he was putting in were useless. And so in Philippians, he says, Whatever happens, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you these things because I do it to safeguard your faith. Whatever happens, rejoice in the Lord. He says, he's now talking about people who add things to Christ and he uses tough language. Tough language. Because these people are also believers. They say they believe in God. They say whatever they are doing is for God. But they are demanding more than Christ. He says, watch out for those dogs. Philippians chapter 3 verse 2. Watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil. The mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. And the word circumcision here means you must convert to Judaism. You must do what the Jews do, do in order for you to be saved. He says, for we who worship by the spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. Human effort. Though I could have confidence in my own effort, if anyone could, indeed if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. I am a real Hebrew if there was to be one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest, the strictest obedience to the Jewish laws. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. I once thought that these things were so valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Do you hear that? All those efforts, obeying the law, and, and, and doing all that he required as it was laid down by Moses, he knew they were so very, but now he considers them worthless because of what Christ was done. And he adds in verse 8, yes, everything is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake I have discarded everything else, counting it as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. Faith in Christ, Christ alone. Not in the stars, not in an hour of the day. Not in the moon. Not in the sun. Yes, God created them for, for reasons, but they are not part of what helps us to gain access to the Father. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. That is verse 9. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death. I want to know Christ. And if we are to pray every day, we need to ask God to help us to know Christ again and again, to know him. Pray night and day. Go for overnights. And if there is any important prayer you need to pray, ask that God helps you to know him better. If you want to fast, and you want to know God, then fast and ask God, help me to know you better. Help me to know what Christ stands for. Help me to know who he is for me. Let us focus on Christ and desire to know him more and more. Spend time with him in prayer. And he will reveal to us what he wants us to do and to be. He will give us his Holy Spirit. And we will experience the gifts that he gives to those who believe in him. He will make us serve him the way we ought to. So long as we don't mix him with other things. So long as we stay focused on him. And let me tell you the temptation is that when you mix in other things, you will convince yourself that I'm so devoted. Because they take your time. I'm so devoted. I even know how the stars move. I know what time God works more as if there is a time when he's sleeping. Yet he tells us he's a God of all seasons. You will feel so much like you will even begin to think that those who don't know when the, star move, the stars move, they, they are less of Christians than you. You will even begin to condemn them and say these are not prayerful because they don't follow the seasons to pray. And we are experiencing that in church. Because that's the deception the devil gives us to find satisfaction in other things 
other than in Christ alone. And Galatians 4:19 tells us, actually, Galatians 4 from 8, when Paul is struggling with people who want to add things to Christ, he says, before you, you Gentiles knew God, you were slaves to the so-called gods that do not even exist. So now that you know God, or should I say that now that God knows you, why do you want to go back again and become slaves once more to the weak and useless spiritual principles of the world? Useless spiritual principles. There are so many that we try to teach and follow. Why do you want to go back? And he says, you are trying to earn favor with God by observing certain days and months and seasons and even years. You are trying to earn favor with God by observing days and months and seasons. And yes, you think that in this year, God is going to be more powerful than the previous year. As sometimes some preachers tell us. And people wait for their things to change in the year. They don't change. God is active all the time. And in verse 11, he says, I fear for you. Perhaps all my hard work with you was for nothing. Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you. As I do in freedom, as I live in freedom from all these things, for I have become like you Gentiles, free from these laws. And verse 19 of Galatians 4 says, My dear children, I feel as if I'm going through labor pains for you. Because they will continue until Christ is fully developed in you, until Christ is sufficient for you. And I pray that Christ will be sufficient in us. We will believe Him to be sufficient. And if you want to seek God, we look for no other formulas, but we look for Jesus. Because he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Praise the Lord. Will you believe that he's enough? And go to him and access the Father all the time, anywhere? And trust that he's hearing you? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your love and your goodness for us. Thank you because you saw the confusion we are in and you said, let me go there myself and dwell among them so that they will see that they have access to me and through Christ you came. We pray that you will be sufficient for us as we pray, as we seek you. Help these your children not to be misled by man-made teachings, but only to follow your word as established through scriptures. Bless each one of us, Lord. And may you continue to answer our prayers and encourage us. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen.